For some of us, change is essential, but for others, change can be uncomfortable. But the truth is that we are all changing. We are all formed by things each and every day. What we listen to, what we watch, the conversations that we have, and the stories we are told all form us and change us. As followers of Jesus, we are called to do just that, to follow Jesus, to let the words, the rhythms, and the life of Jesus shape us, form us, and change us. Hey, here's the deal. Uh, If you haven't been with us, we're doing this series called The Way of Change. Let me just start by saying this, that here at Grace Church, uh, we believe Jesus changes everything. I'm going to say that again. Jesus changes there. And saying yes to Jesus is the way to change. And so here's what we believe, that all of us are sinners, right? Every last one of us are sinners. And that the only way for me to be forgiven of my sin, be part of the family of God, is to say yes to what Jesus did for me. That when Jesus died on the cross, he died for my sin in my place. And so when I say yes, I say yes to that gift of grace. And if you've never done that, like that is, that is the most incredible gift you ever receive. And this whole idea you see in your program of baptism is just a public step of saying, I've said yes to Jesus. But that's where it begins, saying, yes, I believe you died in my place. But here's what happens. What happens then is is that a lot of times, people who would call themselves, you ready, Christians, they have this weird relationship with change. We said it this way, it's not whether change is going to happen, it's not if it's going to happen, it's when it happens, right? Change happens. And so the question isn't if, it's when change happens, how does it happen? And that led us to say this, that a lot of people, look here a second, who call themselves, you see what I'm doing, right? Call themselves Christians, have this weird relationship with change. And what I mean by that is this, is there's a lot of people who are Christians who are exhausted trying to change. They're just exhausted. Maybe that's you this morning. I don't know. You're just exhausted trying to change your life. I became a Christian. Now I'm just exhausted trying to change. And maybe that has made you grumpy. I don't know, right? Uh, Some of you, like your whole relationship with change as a Christian is something that you just deal with guilt. You always feel guilty, right? You're always like, man, I can't measure up. I can't keep up. And so you have this weird relationship with change. Like, I need to change. I can't change. I'm not changing fast enough. And then others of you, your relationship with change is this. You're, You're you're not gritting it out, you're not exhausted, you're not grumpy, you're not guilty, you just given up, right? You just given up on the whole idea of change. And so what you thought is, man, I can't change, so I'm gonna give up and just rest on grace. Like Christians have this weird relation, and for some of you, you're like, I'm not a Christian. And the reason you're not a Christian is because everything I just described, like I know all these grumpy, guilty Christians, why would I wanna be a Christian? The reason, you ready? Christians, this is so important, have this weird relationship with change is because a lot of Christians, maybe you're one this morning, they see change just like decorating a Christmas tree. And so the way they see change is this, is I become a Christian and then I decorate the outside of my life with acts of righteousness. So I gotta be good, kind, I gotta give, I gotta whatever. And so a lot of Christians try to decorate the Christmas tree of their life, so to speak, so that God's impressed, other people are impressed. Here's what we've said, or guess where we're going today. We said that is not the way of change. But Jesus said this, in fact, he doesn't use the word Christian. He says, I want you to come follow me and be my, what? Disciple. And what he says is this, he says, When you are my disciple, I'm the vine, you're the branches, attach yourself. Focus on this end of the branch. And when you attach yourself to me, then you'll produce fruit. That's change. That's the way of change. We said in John 15, he says, I'm the vine. This is Jesus. You're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much, there's our word, fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What Jesus is saying is this, the way of change, listen close, okay, this is so important. You're like, why are you spending, because I read some of the stuff you're posting, and I want to make sure you're not misunderstanding me or misquoting me. The way of change is not decorating the outside of your life, making people impressed with like, look at all the things I'm doing, but the way of change is practicing the presence of Jesus in a way that produces the fruit of the life of Jesus in my life. Big difference. 
How does that happen? Well, in 1 John, it says this. It says, this is how we know that we're abiding or practicing the presence of Jesus. This is how we know. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And so we said this, if you're writing on your notes, write these words down. We said it's more about training than it is trying. The reason some of you feel guilty and exhausted is because you've gone to church all your life, you've heard the preacher talk about what you should be doing, this is what Jesus did, and so you go out and you're like, I'm gonna try really hard to forgive like Jesus, to serve like Jesus, to love like Jesus, which is awesome, but you always come back and you're like, I can't do it, because it's not about trying harder, it's about training. Jesus is the one who taught us this, he said this in Luke, He said, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully, there's a word, trained, will be like their teacher. Paul said, 1 Timothy 4, he said, train yourself to be godly. Everybody look here a second. I'm gonna tell you you something that is true about all of you. Ready? Everybody look here a second. The habits, the rhythms, and the practices of your daily life right now, the habits, Y'all have them, by the way. The rhythms and the practices of your daily life are training you for something. You're being trained for something. You're being, you will change because of the practices in your life, the rhythms in your life, the habits in your life, the disciplines in your life. And what Jesus is saying is simply this. Hey, I want you to abide, remain with me, spend time with me, be trained by my presence in a way that produces my life. So we've already looked at two. We've looked at solitude. If you weren't here for that, I'd go, look, I'd go check that one out, right? I've gotten a lot of feedback on that, right? Solitude, something that we don't enjoy much of in our distracted culture. And then last week, Pastor Aiden did a fabulous job teaching us about relationships and community that Jesus, quite frankly, doesn't make sense apart from relationships. Jesus doesn't make sense apart from relationships. This morning, everybody look here a second. I can almost see your eyes when I tell you this. I want to talk to you about something that I've been a pastor for 26 years. Like, that makes me old, I guess. I don't know. And I have never preached on this. Yeah. I want to talk to you about something that I don't practice that well. Turn to your neighbor and say, this ought to be good. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say it, right? Yeah. I want to talk to you about something I've never preached on. I want to talk to you about something that, I've, that I don't even practice that well, that has challenged me this last week. And I want to talk to you about something that for some of you is going to like sound weird at first. Can we just say that? It's going to be weird and just stay with me to the end. It's going to feel weird, weird, weird at first. Here's what I want to talk to you about. Ready? Buckle your seatbelt. Ready? I want to talk to you this morning about, are you ready? Fasting. And you're thinking, Really? You want to talk to us? Some of you are like, I wish I'd eaten breakfast, right? Some of you are thinking, you want to, I could not have picked a worse Sunday to talk to you about fasting. (laughs) If you don't know and you are living in a cave somewhere, it is Super Bowl Sunday. Over 100 million people are going to watch this thing. Billions of dollars spent on commercials. And that is not what amazes me. I did some research, y'all know I like to do this, right? And what amazes me is the amount of food that is consumed on Super Bowl Sunday, second only to Thanksgiving Day. Isn't that amazing? In fact, I did some research. Before the game ever starts, if you like this kind of stuff, lean in. Before it ever starts, 11.2 million pounds of potato chips will have been eaten. (laughs) I stop, right? 8.2 million pounds of tortilla chips. 79 million avocados will have sacrificed their life for guacamole for the Super Bowl. (laughs) 3.8 million pounds of popcorn before the game kicks off. 3 million pounds of nuts. Then they're going to blow the whistle. Then it's game time. Then it's on, right? And when the whistle blows... From game time, here's what we expect. Pizza Hut expects to deliver 1.5 million pizza pies. Domino's expects to deliver 13 million slices of pizza, enough to cover 5,000 football fields. Not done. I did some research, this was fun. The National Chicken Council, who knew there was such a thing, right? Like to meet the people on that board, right? 
estimates that 1.38, you ready? Billion chicken wings will be eaten tonight during the Super Bowl. When it comes to ribs, 10 million pounds. When it comes to bacon, can I get an amen? Bacon, 12.5 million pounds eaten just during the game. Hamburgers, 14 million, 52 million cases of beer just during the game. Millions of Americans gorging themselves on all kinds of delicious food, right? All kinds of people watching the TV, just consuming food, everybody indulging, except I know tonight for a fact there's going to be at least 22 people that aren't going to be doing that. You know who they are? They're going to be the guys on the field. You know why? Because they've trained for something that, quite frankly, you and I aren't ready for. Isn't that interesting? That's why I want to talk to you about fasting, and I want to talk to you about it this way. I want you to write it down this way. The way of change by practicing the presence of Jesus through fasting. Now, some of you are like, oh, Lord, this is my first Sunday here. Is this what you talk about all the time? No, okay? But I think you're going to be intrigued when we get to the end of this, okay? So stay with me. Stay with me, because I think there's some really intriguing things here. This morning, I want to be as simple as possible, as practical as possible. I want to talk about something that probably if I took a straw pull, most of us have never practiced. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you the roadmap so you know where I'm going, okay? Because there's four things I want to talk about, four things, okay? So you don't need to write them all down right now because we're going to go back and cover them. First is this. I want to talk about what is fasting and what it isn't. So we're going to take an overview. What is it? What isn't it? So some of you have grown up in church, never heard anybody talk about fasting. Welcome, right? Some of you are like, I'm brand new to church. You talk about this every week? No, but I want to talk about what is it because it's in the Bible. Second, I want to talk about what can we observe from Jesus about fasting. So if we're practicing the presence of Jesus, like if I lean into Jesus, what does he teach me about fasting? Third, I want to talk about this. How in the world can fasting be helpful in my spiritual life? in my walk with God. And then fourth, we're just gonna get really practical. How can I practice fasting in my life? These four things is what we're gonna cover, okay? Now, I think there's some interesting things here, right? Even if you leave here disagreeing with some things I say, which is okay, by the way, you don't have to agree with everything I say to come here. I think you're gonna leave here and say, hmm, that's interesting. And I think there's also some challenging things when we get to the end. Let's start here. What is fasting? First, let me say this. I just like to say this. Fasting is not an exclusively Christian practice. Did you know that? Like other religions practice fasting. Did you know that? But I want to take a minute and take a wide angle look at, okay, what does the Bible and biblical Christianity, okay, we're using those terms, say about fasting? And so let's start here. What in the world does the word mean? And here's what it means. If you like stuff like this, literally it comes from a root word and it means to cover your mouth. That's what it means. It it literally is an intentional covering of my mouth. I'm gonna intentionally abstain from food for a specific period of time. And sometimes, rare cases, water. But I'm gonna specifically, intentionally cover my mouth and abstain from food for a specific period of time for a specific purpose. And so, if you're not familiar with your Bible, your Bible's split into two parts. The first part's the Old Testament, the second part's the New Testament. The first part's the beginning of God's story. When you open up the first part of your Bible, the Old Testament, we won't spend tons of time here, but I will tell you this, if you do a flyover of the Old Testament, you'll see fasting talked about. And you'll see kind of a who's who of the Old Testament in, in terms of fasting and practicing this whole thing that we think of as fasting. You'll see people like Moses and David and the prophet and preacher Elijah, the priest Ezra, Nehemiah the wall builder, Isaiah, all those kind of people. When you read the first part of your Bible, they practiced fasting. As you read the Old Testament, there's all kinds of reasons that they fasted, right? And so as you begin to read, you see that some of the reasons that they fasted was repentance of sin. So you have a guy like Nehemiah. You're like, I don't know his story. Well, he was the one in charge of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And and the wall of Jerusalem had, had crumbled because God's people had sinned. And so when he came and saw the state they were in, he literally wept and began to fast and pray. It was a sign of repentance. Uh, When you read about Jonah, many of you heard this, you read this to your kids, Jonah and the big fish, right? You like that story, right? Well, Well, he went to preach to a city. That city was Nineveh. It's the worst sermon ever recorded. 
He didn't want to go. He's like, God, I don't want to preach to those people. I hate them, right? And God's like, go, right? And so he goes, tail between the legs, okay. And he goes, imagine, repent, turn to God. And he walks away. The whole city repents. And the king pronounces a fast. It's fascinating, right? Uh, The Jewish people celebrate something called Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. They fast, repentance of sin. Uh, Prayer, David's praying for his son and he fasts and he begs and he pleads God. In the middle of that, like, God, please. A grief, the king dies and the whole nation fasts. Social justice, they began to fast because there were people who were oppressed. And then there's certain times when these, these... People had these encounters with God and their response was to fast. Fasting is all through the Old Testament. Now, if you take the Old Testament and then you skip the life of Jesus just for now, all of a sudden you get into the New Testament, the book of Acts and on talks about the church. And here's what you find in church history. Paul fasted. If you don't know his story, Paul was a persecutor of the church. And God stopped him in his tracks and he became a preacher. And the very first thing he did was fasted. Not only that, but the early church fasted when they were making some very important big decisions. Uh, the church, even outside of the, Old, uh, the New Testament, they continued fasting. Now, this is interesting. Listen close. And fasting was a very much regular practice of the early church until about 100 years ago. It's interesting, which kind of begs this question. Okay, well, what if we go back and kind of pick up the life of Jesus? What in the world can we observe from Jesus about fasting? Because I think that's gonna take us to where we need to go today because I think there's some really practical things for us to learn about fasting. So let's just, you have your Bibles open to Matthew. Let's start in Matthew chapter three. Matthew chapter three, I want you to stay with me. We gotta build a foundation and then I gotta talk to you about some things, everybody look here, that I don't think they're all gonna be comfortable for all of us in the room. Like I already did this once and it kind of landed kind of interesting as I watched. So stay with me, we gotta build a biblical foundation and then I gotta talk to you about some things that aren't always gonna land in a comfortable fashion. Here's what it says, Matthew three. As soon as Jesus, that's who we're focusing on, was baptized. He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. What a fascinating moment. He saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Fascinating. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. The very next thing you read is chapter four. Look at this. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After, what's the word? Say it out loud with me. After what? Fasting. There's our word. 40 days and 40 nights. Long time. Then probably one of the most, I mean, is this necessary? He was hungry. I bet he was, right? The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So Jesus answers, it's written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Everybody look here a second. Here's what we learned. Jesus fasted, right? And it's interesting to me when he fasted. Don't miss this. He fasted right after he was baptized. Spirit of God, like a dove, alights on him. He hears this voice. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then it says the spirit of God led him into the wilderness and he fasts right before he meets his temptation with Satan. That's interesting to me. You read a couple chapters on, and Jesus then is preaching a very famous sermon. You maybe have heard of it, Sermon on the Mount. And here's what he says. When you what? Say the word. When you fast. He assumes his followers are going to fast. He just assumes they're going to fast. But he said, when you do, then something interesting happens. He says, don't look somber as hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in four. But when you fast, because I assume you're gonna, put all on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Everybody look here. What Jesus, he assumes his followers are gonna fast, but he tells us something interesting. We're gonna make some observations. He says this, that I assume you're gonna fast, But you need to know something. 
you can misunderstand fasting and you can abuse it. You can misunderstand it and you can abuse it. When you begin to see fasting as an act of righteousness, a Christian decoration, you're abusing it. That's what he's saying. When you're, when you're fasting, like, I want everybody to know I'm fasting. Oh, wow, man, they're really devoted to God. Look how emaciated they are. He said, you're abusing it. It's interesting. Matthew 9, he goes on. He said, John disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often? So they're coming to Jesus like, hey, they were the religious leaders. We fast all the time, but your disciples don't fast. They're coming to Jesus like, what's the problem here? We fast all the time and your disciples aren't. We're gonna skip the next slide, David. Just stay with me on this one. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. Everybody look here a second. What's Jesus saying? He's in tr- his disciples are in trouble because all the religious people are like, we fast, man. We're doing this religious activity and we're fasting and your disciples are feasting. And we're gonna talk about that next week. Like, they're not fasting. And they're like, Jesus, why? And Jesus like, why would they fast? I'm with them. There's no need to fast. I'm with them. But I'm going to leave, and then they're going to be anticipating the time when I come, and they'll fast again. Hmm, something interesting in there. Let me go one more, and then let's make some observation. John chapter 4. You don't need to turn there. This happens after this beautiful encounter Jesus has at a well with a Samaritan woman, which would have been culturally like crazy. And he has this conversation. While he's having this conversation, his disciples go into town to try to find a local McDonald's because they want to bring some lunch back to Jesus. When they come back to Jesus after he has this beautiful conversation with this woman, here's what happens. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, that's Jesus, rabbi, teacher, eat something, But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then they said to each other what you and I would say to each other. Maybe somebody got him Burger King. We didn't know, right? Can someone have brought him food we didn't know about? And Jesus teaches something. He says, no, 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 no. You're missing a point. My food, I'm going to not eat because my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You're saying, Dan, help me put all that together. Happy to. I think there's four or five things that we can observe from Jesus about fasting. You ought to write some of these down. They're interesting to me. First is this. This is like the dull moment of the sermon, right? Jesus fasted. And that's just interesting to me. As I practice the presence of Jesus, I'm like, okay, the one I'm following, he fasted. Like he fasted. And, and then I'm intrigued when he fasted because here's what we see and we observe from Jesus, that Jesus fasted in response to God's leading and in preparation for Satan's attack. That's interesting to me. That he fasts in response to the father saying, this is my son, in response to the spirit leading, and he fasts in preparation for Satan's attack. I told you this two weeks ago, that I don't think Jesus met Satan in a moment of weakness, but it actually was a moment of strength. After 40 days of fasting, he meets the tempter. It's interesting. I think this. Jesus assumed his disciples would practice fasting. I can make that observation that he assumes it. Like he says, when you fast, when you decide to do this, he says, here's how I want you to do it. I think there's two other things that we can observe from Jesus, and that's this. That Jesus warned that fasting can be misunderstood and abused. That's why I want you to lean in for the remaining 15 minutes, because I think you could walk out of here and abuse this. I think you could walk out of here and misunderstand what I'm saying. And so there's some really important things we gotta talk about. And then I think the final thing is this, is that for Jesus, fasting, this is probably the most important thing, was an opportunity to feast on the word of God. He says, no, Satan, I'm not gonna turn these rocks into bread because man doesn't live on that bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And fasting, leave that up there a while, David, they're writing, but but it was an opportunity to feast on the word of God and focus on the work of God. He says, hey, I'm not gonna eat your McDonald's lunch because I got food you don't know about. It is food, and that food is to do the work of my father. 
Here's the deal. We'll leave that up there. I know some of you are writing feverishly. Here's the deal. Fasting was practiced by Jesus. It was assumed by Jesus that his followers would. It was something he said can be misunderstood. It was a response to the Father's voice in his life, the Spirit's leading in his life, and it was in order to feast on the Word of God and focus on the Word of God. Now, everybody, listen, listen. This is like, this is the good news moment of the sermon. But, you ready? Everybody listen. Fasting, Ready? is not commanded in the New Testament. Some are like, Super Bowl party back on, right? That's what you're thinking, right? It's not commanded in the New Testament. Like, it's, it's just not, which begs a question. Well, if it's not commanded, how in the world then can fasting be helpful in my spiritual life? Let's throw the next slide up there, Dave. There you go. And I think you ought to write that down because I think we got to entertain that. How in the world then, or maybe a better way to ask the question is this, why in the world would a disciple of Jesus, somebody who has connected their life to Jesus in the 21st century, why would they choose to fast? You you just told me, Dan, it's not commanded. I'm opting out, right? Some of you are like, yes, right? Why would we do it? How can it be helpful? Why did they do it? Why should I do it? I mean, some of you are thinking, this is honestly this is what I thought. Like, for, like, it wasn't taught much when I grew up. And, and so for me, fasting was what emaciated little priests in loincloths did. And, and, and they were monks and things like that. Like, Man, those people fast. But me, why would I fast? Why would I fast if it's not commanded? And why would I fast if food is so good? Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, anybody with me? Like, I love food. I love chocolate cake, apple pie. I love homemade cinnamon rolls. Give me an amen on that. I love potato chips, barbecue chips, Frito chips, tortilla chips. I love barbecued wings, pulled pork. I love ribs, chicken, ham. I love food. Some of my heroes are Orville Redenbacher, Duncan Hines, and Betty Crocker. Can I get an amen? Anybody with me? Why would we fast? No slide for this anywhere. No slide, but you ought to write this down. Here's the key. Food is not bad. That's not the point of today. Food is not bad. That's not the point. The point isn't that somehow food, bad, fasting, good. That's not the point. But the reason that fasting can be helpful to me in my spiritual walk, in my abiding with Jesus, in practicing the presence of Jesus is simply this, and you ought to write this down. Some of us have an unhealthy relationship with food. And this is where, quite frankly, the conversation gets tender. I've already talked to people this morning. Because if we're honest, some of us and some of you have a struggle with food. Our nation does. I don't need to read tons of stats to you, but you know that our nation considers snacking a a national pastime. Three quarters of our people that call themselves Americans feel like they need to or should lose weight. The average family in America wastes about fifteen hundred dollars worth of food every year that they throw away. Food is what some of us do when we're bored. Food is what some of us do when we're stressed out. Some of us in the room would say we are addicted to food. Some of us have this unhealthy relationship with food and that unhealthy relationship with food that we have, stay with me, creates another tension with something that is a phenomenon in our culture because food's not bad, but some of us have this unhealthy relationship with food and it creates a tension with another phenomenon in our culture. In our culture, we live in a culture that, see if you can't relate, that idolizes the body. Are you tracking with where I'm going? We live in a culture where somehow we have defined for men and women what the perfect and preferred body looks like. And all of a sudden, a war ensues. And that war that ensues can ensue and take place and enrage in the same aisle in the same store. 
Because in the same aisle, in the same store, you might look this way and see a supermodel size one with perfect proportions, whatever that is, turn your head and see an apple fritter and say, I want that and that. And I'm not sure how in the world they go together. You see, here's what I know. Some of us, some of us have an unhealthy relationship with food and some of us, quite frankly, struggle idolizing our bodies. That's why some of us, and this is you, I just wanna talk to you, I'm so glad you're here. That's why some of us this minute are struggling with eating disorders. That's why some of us are struggling right now comparing our body with, quite frankly, bodies that have been airbrushed and represent a very small portion of our population. That's why some of us are addicted, you ready? Addicted to working out because we somehow have begun to idolize our bodies. And so this weird relationship we have with food and this way in which we struggle idolizing our bodies causes causes this war to take place. And the Bible talks about this and it helps us understand fasting. You're like, this is where we need to go. Because what the Bible says is this, is this weird relationship we have with wanting to satisfy the cravings of our appetite, idolizing our body, is something the Bible calls the, ready? The flesh. The flesh. Now, when the Bible talks about flesh, it's not talking just about our body. But it's talking about the cravings and appetites and impulses that we all have. And it talks about satisfying those appetites, cravings, and impulses apart from God. That when I satisfy them apart from God, that's the flesh. A writer I read this week said, it's, it's, unrede- it's my unredeemed humanness. A guy named Paul talks about it. Now we're gonna get practical. He says in Galatians 5, you, my brothers and sisters, at Grace Church in Norton, you were called to be free. Don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. There's our word. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. Then he goes on. So I say, walk by the spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the what? Flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you're not to do whatever you want. What is he saying? He's saying that inside of each of us, there's this thing called the flesh, these appetites that are crying out inside of all of us to satisfy themselves apart from God, to somehow satisfy themselves, to satisfy themselves, to quench them. When I, if it feels good, I'm gonna do it. If it looks good, I'm gonna get it. If I think, and I'm just gonna get it. I'm gonna satisfy it. I'm gonna indulge it which helps me understand why fasting might be helpful. The reason fasting might be helpful is because most of us are not used to saying no to our flesh. You see, most of us aren't used to that. Our culture reinforces that you and I are simply a compilation of unsatisfied appetites. And you know this, I don't even need to make a case for this, but our culture wants to say to us that you and I are just like the cookie monster. Raise your hand if you know who I'm talking about, cookie monster, Sesame Street, you know? Like, I need cookie, just like that. That's the flesh. I need it, I need it, I need it, I feel it. Psychologists are more refined about it. They call it the pleasure principle. If it looks good, if it feels good, go for it. And the Bible calls it the flesh. And to be honest, our gratifying, indulging the flesh is the very thing that has led some of us not simply to struggle with food, but it's this indulgence of the flesh and gratifying our flesh has led some of us to be in debt to unbelievable fashions. 
This indulgence of the flesh is the very thing that has led some of us down the road of addictions. This indulgence of the flesh has led some of us into sexual promiscuity. You're saying, Dan, help me understand that. Well, the way it works is this. I have people come in my office all the time. This is what they say. I know what God wants me to do with my money. But this is what I want to do. I know what God created sex for and where he created it to be enjoyed. But cookie monster, you see what I'm saying? It's the flesh. All of a sudden when I begin to realize that, I'm like, well, maybe fasting isn't some archaic discipline. It's interesting to me that the very first temptation talked about in the story of God revolved around food. And when you fast forward to Jesus' temptation, Satan fired off a temptation right off the bat that revolved around what? Food. When you read that, you begin to get an understanding of why in the world and how fasting can be helpful. I don't want you to miss this. Look back at Matthew 4. Let's make some observation and then give you some practical suggestions. Matthew 4, Jesus, led by the spirit of the wilderness, tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I bet he was. Tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written. He's like, nope, not gonna do that. Like, I don't know, I would have been tempted. Like, wow, you know, homemade bread, right? Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Ready? What in the world can we grab from this? I want you to write this down somewhere. I think what we can grab is fasting is a way for me to say no to my flesh in order to feast on God. I think that's the point. I think fasting isn't just a Christian decoration. I fast, but fasting is a way for me to say, I'm gonna say no to a lesser appetite so that I can say yes to a greater appetite. I'm gonna say no to indulging so that I can say yes to the promises of God. I'm gonna say no to my flesh so that I can feast on God. Because Psalm 34, eight says this, and you ought to write that down, look it up, test me on it, says this, taste and see that the what? Not there yet, bud. Taste and see that the what? Lord is good. That's what he says, right? And so what fasting becomes is this way for me to begin to feast on the goodness of God, to begin to enjoy the goodness of God. There's a second thing, and now we can throw that out there, David. John 4. This moment when they brought him his McDonald's lunch, and they said, Rabbi, eat something. He said, I have food to eat you know nothing about. No one else brought me anything. Verse 34, he says this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What if, guys, fasting wasn't just for me to feast on the word of God, but what if, I want you to write it down this way, fasting is a way for me to say no to my flesh to focus on the needs of others. That's what Jesus is doing. What if fasting is a way for me to train myself to say no to indulging my appetites in order that I might enter in, join Jesus in somehow empathizing, paying attention to the needs of others? You ought to write this down. We don't have time to look at it, but write this down on your notes. Isaiah 58. Just write it down. Double dog dare you to look it up. It's a whole chapter about fasting. And what happens in this chapter is God's people had fasted and they're complaining to God. You know why they're complaining? Because we fasted, God, and you're not giving us what we want. Here's a note to self. Fasting is not a hunger strike on God. I'm gonna fast till he gives me what I want. God says that's because you're fasting with the wrong idea. 
God says fasting is about you somehow joining me, drawing near to my heart. And he says, here's when I know that you're fasting in a way that is drawing near to my heart. When you fast, you all of a sudden pay attention to those who are poor. You all of a sudden begin to feed those who are needy. You all of a sudden begin to help those who are afflicted. Fasting is a way for me to say, I'm not going to just focus about somehow indulging and gratifying my appetites, but I'm going to begin empathizing with the needs of others. Fasting becomes a way for me to focus on the physical needs of others, even the spiritual needs of others. Leads to this question, we're done. Well, Dan, how in the world can I begin to practice fasting? Now, let me say it again. It's not commanded in the New Testament. You leave here and say, I'm never doing it. You're fine. But I have a challenge for you at the end of this. How can I begin to practice fasting? I got two things, and I want you to write them down. First is this. If I was you, I'd plan to fast. Plan to fast. Fasting is intentional. Plan to fast. So if you're going to plan to fast, here's some hints. very first thing I'd say is fast slow. I'd write it down that way. Fast, slow. You're saying, what do you mean by that? I'd start slow. I don't think a 40-day fast is where I'd start. Can I get amen on that? I'm not even sure it's where I'd end, by the way, okay? But I would plan to skip a meal intentionally or two meals. I'd, I would start slow. Second thing I'd say is, is I'd fast smart. Like, you know, some of you need to go see your physician, right? Some of you have physical things going on, diabetic or whatever it might be. Like, I would talk to a physician. Like, I'd be smart. Remember, the goal isn't that this is like, I gotta fast. No, it's not commanded, right? So if you got physical things that are keeping you from fasting from food, I'd fast smart, which leads me to this. I'd fast quiet. Like, if you're gonna begin fasting and like, don't tell everybody. For some of us, that's gonna be a struggle because some of us, we see fasting as like, man, look at how devoted I am to God. I fast and like, yeah, yeah right? She's like, wrong, right? That's abusing fasting. I'd be quiet. Just like, I'm going to make this decision to somehow focus on practicing the presence of Jesus. But that leads me to say this. I would fast creative. You see, the primary way in which the Bible talks about fasting is fasting from food. Now, lean in a second. But the principle of fasting can apply to whatever craving of my flesh I just don't think I can do without. And he says, okay, food, I would definitely start there, but man, I would be creative. For some of you, you can't do food for medical reasons. Doesn't mean you can't fast. And I think what the principle is this is, what is the one thing I don't think I can do without? What is the one thing my flesh is screaming, I gotta have, I gotta get, cookie monster. For some of you, it's, I don't know, social media maybe. For some of you, it maybe is TV. I don't know. You know, I'm not, I'm not, for some of you, maybe it's the show that you have to watch every, I don't know. For some of you, God forbid, it's coffee. I don't know, you know. For some of you, you fill in the blank. What's the one thing? You're like, I can't, that you might say, I wonder what would happen if I decided to for a day for a week, whatever it might be. Which leads me to the second thing. I would plan to fast, and then I would say this, be purposeful in your fast. Be purposeful in your fast. You're saying, Dan, what do you mean by that? Well, two things under this that are just suggestions, and then we're done. First is this, when you fast, plan to feast on God instead. Listen close to this. When you plan to fast, whatever you do, a day, a meal, whatever it is, plan your meal with God. What I mean by that is, how are you going to feast on God? Take your Bible and begin to plan a feast. How am I going to feast on the Word of God? Take your prayer journal. How am I going to feast on talking to God? I double dog dare you to plan to feast with God. You want to plan a feast with God? Plan to fast in order to do some deep, you ready? Confession before God. If you want to taste and see that God is good, Allow yourself to do some deep confession. Because when you do some deep confession, just you and God, be quiet about it. All of a sudden, 
you begin to taste and see that God is good. You know why? Because he said, Dan, if you confess your sin, I'm faithful. Oh, I like that goodness. I'm just. Oh, I like that goodness. And I will forgive you. I like that goodness. Second thing I would say is when you fast, plan to focus on others instead of your appetites. All I would say about that is this, that if you plan a fast, whether from food or social media or whatever it is, legitimately plan a way in which you're going to focus your attention on others, whether that's you begin focusing praying for somebody else, praying for your three, maybe that's you legitimately saying, I'm going to go serve at the haven of rest, serve at a soup kitchen, whatever it might be, but begin to plan your fast in a way that you can legitimately, purposefully plan to focus on empathize with the needs of others. Some of you sponsor children, and maybe it's a way for you to fast a meal so that you can focus on, we we do Feed My Starving Children, kids who literally are getting one meal a day and loving it. And maybe it's a way for you to do that. I don't know. It's not, not to feel guilty. It's just a, a way for me to join Jesus, abide with Jesus, so that all of a sudden the fruit of Jesus can grow. Everybody look here and, and I'm done. You ready? You can leave here and say, ain't doing that. Right? Honestly, you can. Like, and I'll shake your hand like, yeah, you were listening, you know? But if that's you, you ready? And you, you would call yourself a follower of Jesus, lean in. And you're like, I ain't fasted. No command. Okay? So, if that's your choice, can I ask you this question? If you choose not to, here's my question. Then how will you, you ready? How will you and how are you training yourself to say no to your flesh in order to feast on God? Because you and I both know there's a cookie monster inside of all of us. And he's going crazy in some of our lives. And even if you leave here and say, that's the dumbest sermon I've ever heard, and you may, and send me an email, I don't care. But here's the deal. I still would look at you and say this. How will you train yourself to say no to your flesh that is screaming, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, in order that you can say yes to practicing the presence of Jesus in order to feast on the goodness of God, in order to focus on the needs of others. You see, here's the deal. The deal isn't go out and buy fast. The deal is this, I don't know about you, but I want to abide with Jesus in such a way that the fruit of the life of Jesus begins to grow in my life so that the people in my life who bump up against me, who bump up against my life and what's growing out of the branches of my life, they can taste and see that the Lord is good. I'm gonna pray with you and then after I pray, we're gonna be dismissed. At the front, there's gonna be people that, that they're here, just, you may be here and like maybe something that we talked about is just a struggle for you. You're like, I just wanna pray with somebody. Maybe you just came in having a, a no good, very bad day. And you're like, I just need to pray with somebody. We wanna be a place that walks with you and helps you. Maybe, maybe you've had a struggle. Maybe the flesh is, is, is a struggle for you right now. Maybe you don't know Jesus. And you've never said yes to Jesus. So there'll be people up here to pray with you no emotional plea, no spotlight on you. And and they would love to just spend some time talking to Jesus with you. But Father, we're gonna end. I love that you let me do what I do with the people that I get a chance to do it with. I love the folks in this room. And some of them, I, I gotta believe, are struggling. They have an unhealthy relationship with food. And they're, I don't know, they're, they're embarrassed by it, they're guilty with it, they struggle with it. God, I'm so glad they're here. And God, would you meet them where they're at? And because they're sitting around others that maybe have this unhealthy relationship with their body and idolizing their body. And there's this war going on in us, Lord. And it's so easy in our culture because everything tells us to feed our flesh. And so I pray that whether it's fasting or another way, that for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, that you'd help us to train ourselves to say no to our flesh in order that we might feast on the goodness of God, in order that we might be able to identify with others. 
and even partake in the work of God in their life, physically and spiritually. Yeah, thanks for a different kind of teaching, but one that kind of leans in in a real tangible way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.